December 28th will mark the 25th anniversary of Starcade 97, the culmination of a year-long build where Sting would finally step back in the ring to face Hollywood Hulk Hogan for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. The stage was set for a main event to become immortalized in wrestling history, and it did, but for all the wrong reasons. And for the first time in over 20 years on that 25th anniversary, Eric Bischoff and Nick Patrick will reunite to watch back and discuss what really happened that night at the MCI Center in Washington, D.C., hosted by Conrad Thompson, a topic that led to one of the most heated exchanges in the history of 83 weeks. And now you're going to act like it's ludicrous that we might think that that's what happened here when you managed to f*** up the single biggest moment in the history of wrestling, and now 20 years later you get on here and lie through your f***ing teeth and say it's because he wasn't tamed. I'm not lying too much, Chief. You I'm f- finished ju- over a tan? Is this real? Ad Free Shows presents a premium watch along event, The Fast Count, with Eric Bischoff and Nick Patrick, December 28th, 10 p.m. Eastern, immediately following AEW Dynamite. All $29 level members and higher are invited to join, and Top Guy members will be able to ask Eric and Nick questions about this controversial night in wrestling. No spray tan necessary. Sign up today and reserve your spot at adfreeshows.com. The recognized symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, your friend and mine, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? The heck you couldn't do it by yourself. You flapping your jaws down there in Alabama, you could do my world without Hi, Conrad. Happy, 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 happy my world recording with a live studio audience. Let's roll. Hey, man, doing something a little different. Uh, we're doing my world live. And, uh, if you're enjoying what you're seeing live, but feel free to throw up that hashtag hashtag my world live. Of course, our studio audience comes to us today from adfreeshows.com. Uh, we've often bragged that you get these shows early and ad free. Well, how about in real time? Uh, so h- here we are. Let's, uh, let's jump into it, man. Before we do though, I feel like we should at least, uh, touch base on, on, on what's going on in my world for Jeff Jarrett. So we saw last week, um, you were on AEW dynamite and I know this time of year, our calendar starts to fill up for 2023. The holidays are right around the corner. What's new for double J. Oh boy. Uh, Springfield lucky horseshoes schedule comes out this week. I'm just going to bombard you with baseball talk. No. All kidding aside, we're pretty excited. The inaugural year was fantastic. We're looking at um, adding to the teams, Conrad. I can kind of let that uh, cat out of the bag, but it's a, it, it is. Uh, the planning on the offseason, Jamie, my partner up in Springfield, he loves, he absolutely loves just kind of getting fired up because uh, opening day will be here before we know it. So baseball world, Russell Quest has a launch date. Um Candidly, Conrad, this live recording, you know, in my DNA, um, in my dad's DNA, in Christine Jarrett DNA, we're live event promoters. So getting yes, to is pretty dead gum cool. So uh, we'll call it my day job. Um, been there a little over a month. And so now we're, you know, plowing the ground, but uh, a lot of cool things coming in Q1 next year. And uh, hope to hope, hope we get some announcements out sooner rather than later. Um, but there's a lot of cool things, you know, it's, uh, it goes without saying Conrad, the, um, well, the WWE's 40, 50, 60 year old company. I mean, the lineage goes back three or four generations, uh, AEW. I mean, it's brand you know, new, man. Well, it's, it's just, it, it's, it, you know, people may or may not take this right way, but in a lot of ways it's, it's, uh. It's no longer the embryo. It's been born, but it's still in the infant stages. And, oh, it's just, it's it's really cool. And, and I touched on it last week. When you talk to folks that are outside the wrestling bubble. Yes. Uh, and, and me and you have often shared this. Matter of fact, our meeting later on today is with folks that 
can't wait to sit down and talk to us, but they're outside the bubble and, and they just see things from a different lens. We get caught up in so much day to day and what happened here and who's second guessing that and who's doing this. And Oh my God, did you see what they said on Twitter? I can't believe he didn't say this. And you the go minutia. to the minutia. Well, you, it's, I, I went to the gym this morning and, uh, guy next to me on the treadmill, we were kind of talking about, we started into NFL talk. Uh, and man, the Titans laid an egg. Um, but hat, hats off to the winners of that game. I have a connection to the winners of that game. But no, and then it got into college football, and then it got back into wrestling. And I said, buddy, you have no idea how folks get down a rabbit hole, and they don't even realize they're in the wrong rabbit hole from the very beginning. But um, life is good, man. Holiday season is here. A lot of good eating, a lot of good times, and uh, it's Monday. So I love Mondays because it uh, it's a fresh new start on the week. I love that you had mixed emotions this past weekend. If you're not an American football fan, the Jaguars, who came into the program four and eight, would actually get the dub over the Tennessee Titans, who came in seven and five. On paper, I don't think anybody had the Jags winning that, except for our old friend Tony and his fam and Boy, they thumped that head for y'all, man. 14 points. That let's, was. Hey, Kyle, let's talk about something here. If you want to just kind of dive into a rabbit hole, I would did. <clears throat> well, and I, I, it goes without saying. So I've been doing some promotion here locally because tomorrow night at the Preds, Tuesday, as we're speaking, it's Rock the Red Kettle Night, Conrad. Yeah. Salvation. Tonight. So tonight, everybody's listening tonight. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's uh, but you know, it, and this goes for the whole season. Salvation Army, a lot of folks. Um, you know, they see the kettles out and the bell ringing and, and everything, but then sometimes there's mixed messaging, what it's all about, but Salvation Army, I'm, I'm very honored to be a part of the organization and the ambassador of the Middle Tennessee campaign. But, uh, when you, you look at those red kettles and every dollar, you know, here in Middle Tennessee, um, a thousand dollars gets someone off the streets for a month, 30 days. And so that's kind of the goal. It's real simplistic, but, uh, back to my treadmill talk, my elliptical talk culture, Conrad, uh, we, we, we kind of talked Tennessee Titans. Um, uh, again, I've been talking about, we, we fired our general manager mm -hmm. this past week on Tuesday. Yep. He's yep. the one who assembled the team. He's never had a losing season. We were the top seeded. I mean, just, and he, through the COVID year, I think we played over 90 players. It was a record in the NFL, that many people coming in and out because all the COVID tests. And he, he's assembled a team, but the culture was radically changed and the players were kind of dismissing it and the ownership was dismissing it and, oh, it needed to have a change. I didn't see the upside to, to nuking the culture of the team midseason. And, you know, he got, he got canned coming off the week of AJ Brown and the Philadelphia Eagles. And I know there's some ads free members that would love to chime in on this, but the culture was changed in the Tennessee Titans. And, and, um, it, it, to me, uh, leadership comes down to having the vision and how they did not see that ch changing the guy who literally hired these folks, the player co Vrabel coaches, but the guy that was, in charge of hiring and firing was let go. And we are three games up. Well, no longer. We were three games up going into this Titans were and, and, uh, took the, the, the huge L the Jaguars boat raced us. It was not even a contest, uh, in the second half. It was, it was, it was, it was ugly. And so, you know, just the culture of everything. I think we have a culture on this podcast. I think there's a culture no matter where you go and exist, but when you have a living, breathing or, or organization, culture is utmost important. So it, uh, I don't know, man, had me thinking over the last uh, day, day uh, when taking that W, just how important culture is to winning and losing in life. Well said, uh, culture is important and we're going to be talking about quite a different culture here today. We're getting on our way back machine to talk about TNA from 2002. Uh, but before we do that, I want to make mention of something that happened on social media this past week. It looks like Vince Russo is starting to discuss on his platform, his relationship with Jeff Jarrett and, uh, I feel like maybe we need to do some investigative reporting and have you take a listen or see what that's about. And then maybe we get some sort of a response, some sort of back and forth 
were you surprised to hear that Vince Russo says you worked him? Do we even want to give this guy a rub? I, right. I, I, this, sure, maybe. <laughs> well, let me, I, I'll just say this. No, it didn't surprise me a, at all. In 2022, I've been very blessed. Conrad, you always joke from the day. Your opening kind of teaser on the podcast was, well, Conrad, give it to me. If cats have nine lives, Jared have 10. And, yep. and then in different sales meetings, whether it's ads, all, all this, you, Conrad has a unique way of saying, Jeff has a freaking bizarre story, a really bizarre story. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I mean that, that, and I'm, I'm super grateful for it, but in 2022, I've been lucky enough or blessed enough or whatever it may be. Um, things have fallen my way. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, from, from, from GCW to NWA to WWE to AEW. And it goes without saying, um, all the hard work that was put into Ric Flair's last match and, and the notoriety and in the continued press and, Everything that goes with that, we're going to get into Bischoff and Flair here in a minute whenever you're ready to, but it doesn't surprise me. That's It's in Russo's DNA. Of course he's going to jump on the bandwagon, and I say that, I'm trying to say that with, with diplomacy, but, but you know, uh, he says that I worked him. So says the man behind the paywall. So, hey, folks, I'm going to talk about a guy who's who's – supposedly work me, but I'm going to tell you behind my paywall. I just chuckled to no end that I, I, I'll say this, Vince, I'll say it to you. <laughs> it, it is something that I have shared with you from time to time, but after a while, folks that don't listen, I suggested to him years ago and I'll suggest it now. I would love to know his thoughts after he took a look at the man in the mirror and let him say, Hmm, what was my role in all of these instances that I supposedly worked him? What is Vince's role? What, what, what did he do good or what did he do bad? But I'll throw this back at you, uh, uh, Conrad, and I would love to get your response on this. So he says that I worked him in, in this relationship. Do you think there was ever a time that Vince He's a writer. He's proud right. to say he's a writer that he wrote a segment and wrote that segment out. And when I walked through the curtain after it, he regretted it. Do, do, do you think that I ever didn't deliver for him? No, he, 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 I mean, maybe I did here and there, but, but for the most part, I'm sure he's going to take this and Conrad, I'm pissed off. You're even giving him the, giving him the spotlight, but it, it is, <clears throat> And look, I've screwed up so many times in my life and I own all of my screw ups, but Vince is a guy who it's always self pity. It's always, woe is me. It's always look what this guy did. This guy worked me. This guy did that. I'm the smartest man in professional wrestling. Here's the cold, hard truth. When WCW closed down, who's the only person that has given him a full-time job in the last 20 years, Jeff Jarrett. Mic drop. And on that note, let's talk about our topic today. Uh, All right, you're not going to give me a good screaming, yelling. Your dog cussed no, me last no, week. No, no. Listen, I don't know the ins and outs of your relationship with Vince. And as you know, and this boy has been criticized because I really do treat people how they treat me. And I've never done real business with Vince. It's always just super casual. And man, he's a charming, nice, easy to guy, easy to get along with guy. And I hear that changes when you work with him. I mean, I, I know what how Eric feels, and I know how you feel, and I think I the world. Knows. Look, I, many years ago, and I got emails. I have look. I know. I, I can't say that he forgave me or didn't. I know that I've forgiven him. I, I know exactly when fundamentally our relationship changed forever. When Janice Carter looked me in the eye, Dixie's three seats down. Dean's four seats down. Andy Barton's here. Um, John Gaborik's in the room. Uh, who uh, There was a four or five of us in the room. Coming stations, 209, 10th Avenue South, Nashville, Tennessee. And we have these board meetings. And this is 2013. 
a lot of dust had settled. Um, uh, lots of dust had settled. Uh, as far as Hogan and Bischoff and the financial death spiral was in full effect. And we're kind of having a rally the troops meeting. And we get toward the very end of the meeting. And it was a positive meeting. And more or less, Janice was saying, hey, guys, she's in Dallas. We're in, we're in, we're in uh, Nashville. For all intents and purposes, she didn't say these words, but it's what she meant. How are you going to pull the news up? Mm. I, I, I bet. How are you going to pull the nose up on this plane? And that was kind of the, 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 the gist of the meeting. And we got toward the end of it. And Janice said, oh, before we go, hey, before we go, hey, Jeff, I got to ask you a question. What did, what do you think, what do you think, and she's looking and you could hear a pin drop in the room. How do you think Vince is going to do this time around? And I go, excuse me, Janice. She said, how do you think Vince Russo is going to help us this go around? I said, Janice. I'll just be honest with you. I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't even know. I didn't even, I don't even know that he's back. The meeting was immediately over. Dixie couldn't run out of that room fast enough. So after all the water under the bridge, look, and, and I get it. He's got to feed his family. He's got to get a paycheck. I totally understand that. I really, really do. I did. I understood it then. I understand it now. But at the end of the day, I get it. All those years, Dutch, my dad, we documented on here. Um, I, I could tell you a, a number of folks that would just say, Jeff, you're, you're kind of not seeing the reality of the situation. I said, okay, point taken. It sunk in. So help me understand. Are you saying that when, when she says, how do you think Vince Russo will do this go around? It's clear at that point, he had been in conversation with everyone in TNA, but you, he was back on the payroll and you didn't know full bore and, and the executive committee of Andy Barton, John Gaburk, Dean Broadhead, Dixie Carter. I, I, you know, th that we were, I came, we came to that meeting. Now you got to remember into 2009, they kicked me as far out as they possibly could. And I think if it wouldn't have been for Bob Carter, I'd have gone all the way out, but the company was making six, 8 million a year. Now here we are, 2010, 2011, 2012. Now we're into 2013 and it was red ink. And so you know, there was a, there was a time of framing how we pulling the nose up and Vince's history since 2002 with the company and Dixie didn't know, look, no need to go into all that, but they hired this guy and it was on the payroll and he's coming back and, and here's all this. And I was left in the dark. It told me everything I needed to know that, that, that th th this, nothing has changed. Like literally nothing has changed. Um, and I'd love to kind of figure out exactly what month that was. I could probably do that, but me and Toby had already had our conversations. They were kind of running conversations, but in 2013, uh, around Easter, uh, of 2013. So February, January, February, March, the wheel started putting in motion and that's a whole nother podcast of of what bob and janice were keeping from dixie and the ndas were going to be signed and what documents were going to be released and all, all that kind of stuff but but i knew then that that the strategy that me and toby were putting in place i was going to play that out uh as far as it could go and if if if, if the acquisition didn't happen i i knew that that there was there was no long-term future for me there. I knew that. Did you feel like just based on y'all's previous personal relationship, he should have given you some sort of heads up 
and you're, and I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get to is selfishly, I would have thought not selfish with my feet, but we all kind of knew the leadership that had took taken place over the last 72 months, if right. you will. We knew where that took us. Uh, so it, 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 it look, and it's, it, what was it? The sing? it was kind of the straw that broke the camel back, but that means there's multiple straws that had been tattered and sh shredded month after month. Now at this point, year after year. So, so I don't want to put everything on that one meeting, but it just kind of crystallized that I'm like, shoot, I know exactly what I'm dealing with right here uh, again. It sounds like more than anything, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to understand it kind of hurt your feelings. Um, I mean, you said you get it. I understand the guy's got a family to support. He needs an income, blah, blah, blah. But given all the water under the bridge and all the starts and restarts and all the, okay, let's try again. Maybe it hurts your feelings a little that all this is happening. What? Nobody's communicating. I'm, I'm not going to dismiss that. Sure. Sure. That's a component of it, but the success and the survival of me, I, you know, wife and five kids. Yes. That, that, that was my priority that I, I knew that for, for me to be a positive producing and revenue producing man of the house, if you will, mm -hmm that that wasn't going to happen in those circumstances because Dean was holding on to his job and it kept his mouth shut. Andy had wife and kids, uh, to, 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 you know, to, to do that. And Vince did too. And Dixie did too, all this, but there was, there was no unity in the group at all. And that, that was a very clear. Um, and I know for a fact, Dean and Andy, uh, before that and after that, it wasn't their call right. at all. It was Dixie's call. Keep it hidden from Jeff. Um, this sounds like an episode of survivor. <laughs> Nobody wants to get voted off the Island. Is that fair to say? Oh, well, he, he, I mean, look, this is we're not, what we're talking about 20 years ago that we're going to folks, we're going to get to our topic, but in the, uh, at this run at, at this point in time, again, we went from profitability to losing money. And I knew in that room, the spike relationship, what it was, what it had become and where I believed it was headed. They had lost complete faith yeah. in leadership. It was look what happened less than 12 months later. Yeah. And I knew that Janice didn't know how spike viewed Vince Russo. I got you. Uh, just it, it was our partners would no matter how you saw it, and Vince would I guarantee you he would say yeah bro th they may have viewed that but here's why accepting no responsibility Dixie accepting no responsibility look I know I screwed up multiple times but also know my track record in, in the relationships domestically and internationally but it was it was you know it was that was anyway we, we're back on Russo well, to make, Let me just to make this. money I, behind his paywall and you got me down a rabbit hole and well, that's fun, man. Ass in a good mood. <laughs> well, you know, if you're in a good mood and you want to change, you want that to change, start a podcast with me. And at least for two hours a week, it's going to be roller coaster of emotions. All right. Bischoff is torching Rick. Hang on. We're going to talk about that later. <laughs> what I want to put a button on right now. Um, and what, boy, I don't mean for this to sound the way it does. Okay. If anybody is sort of unsure of who has those relationships in wrestling. Cause I can't speak to what did or didn't happen in TNA. I wasn't there. I don't know. And there is a, he said, she said, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in the years to come here on this program. But when I take a look at who Jeff Jarrett has worked with and for in the last 12 months. I mean, I don't even think I have to finish the rest of the sentence form your own opinion. I, uh, if you're not sure who to believe or who has the relationships or, or what have you, well, actions speak louder than words. And it does feel like maybe he's trying to, I didn't even consider that you thought 
Hey man, maybe there's a little bit of buzz on my name and he thinks he can squeeze some, some juice out and put it behind the paywall. My brain didn't even, didn't even cross my, my mind. I just thought, man, maybe Vince has a hard on for you. And, uh, I know you've got a hard on for days these days. Thanks to blue chew. Come on now. You knew it had to happen. Eventually the nights are getting longer, but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. We're not just talking about tweets between Eric Bischoff and Rick Flair. We're talking about that hog meat, baby. This episode is sponsored by blue chew guys. We all know that confidence can take you far in life. That's especially true in the bedroom. When it comes time to, uh, <clears throat> step up to the plate. Nick Foley and I call it like a hot tag for your wiener. Blue Chew, this is a vibe right here, this music. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. Here's the best part, y'all. It's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office. No awkward conversations. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made here in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package. But, man, when you uh, go ahead and chew one of these mugs up, it's going to feel like a guitar shot to the no-no area. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform... Sing it, ladies. Chew it and do it. Have better sex, y'all. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code MYWORLD at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is MYWORLD to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. But we need this song to keep going as we go back and get a, a tight shot on Jeff Jarrett. Because I got a question for you, Jeff. Oh boy, I was about to enjoy the 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 the, uh, the comment section. Man, you, Johnny, you uh, do you know if your dad still listens to the show and I'm on here talking about your erections every week? Because I need to get my act together if Mr. Jarrett's listening. You know what? I saw him. He uh, he watched. Oh boy, do you watch Yellowstone, Conrad? I do. My parents do, and I have to have conversation with them. Okay, like Karen loves it, but my dad. And, and my stepmom, Deborah, God rest her. She's the best. Uh, they, they drive, they came out to Hendersonville. They live South of Nashville to go over at a couple's house. And it's like group watching. Anyway, they came by last night. You know, what my old man said he's working on some kind of thing. I have no idea, but I just got to share this with you. He said, Hey son, you asshole. I'm like, Whoa, he was feeling great last night. He oh. said, before it's over, you and old damn Dutch Mantel aren't going to be the only wrestlers to have a, uh, wrestling uh place in the smithsonian institute and i said what he goes yeah i'm working on something i'll share with it later i have no idea i have no context no nothing but uh i'm not sure he's a my world listener he's lived through some of this and i do know this okay I'm, this is a little inside not just baseball inside family we kind of in our relationship it's all always you know we've done it's been up and down that he has what he experienced at TNA mm -hmm. I have what I experienced at TNA and it's sometimes things were good with us and sometimes are bad, but we really, there's no fruit. There's no meat on the bone to come out any conversations. So my guess would be if he looked at the topic and it said TNA, I I, it. I, yeah, I, I don't think he'd have any interest in it. Not yeah, He loves you, but you know, um, j just no interest in it. So, Hey man, fire away on blue chew, just <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want to talk about, pal. And Hey, that, uh, soft porn music is a, is a unique little twist. You guys have added shout out. That was Marcus's selection and it was a good one. No, no, no. That is in, there's no doubt that when this gentleman gets in his car on his Spotify playlist this is i guarantee you this is a dave silva special i don't know man marcus said hey is this too cheesy and I, I heard the first beat and i said no that's actually perfect but as it kept going and you had heard those ladies in the background it was almost like a val venus theme song remix and i was like 
too much. Oh, this is the move right here. I like this. Oh, good stuff, man. Good Let's stuff. get into our topic. Uh, if we don't get started now, we'll never make it. Because uh, you and I have a big non-disclosed downtown Nashville meeting today, and I can't be late. So. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about, um, the end of 2002 as a reminder where we left off, it's Vince Russo hitting Ron Killings with a guitar to help crown new NWA champion. And then he's going to unmask as Mr. Wrestling three. At this point, the Panda deal is official. And, uh, we've touched on that a little bit. Uh, there Meltzer would say they're attempting to build the promotion around the combination worked shoot and total work three-way program with sports entertainment versus pro wrestling. Of course, Vince Russo leading the sports entertainment side. Uh, and then of course, evil, which is led by Jim Mitchell. Is that the goal here? SEX versus pro wrestling versus evil three big factions. And I know. I mean, w when I dove back into the research, look, maybe today positioned evil, well, I'll call it the, the new church. Father Jim Mil Mitchell's group was the new church and it, it had a different vibe. They were not a part of SEX, but I don't ever remember thinking it was going to be kind of a, a, a three-way deal. It was let's, let's take off with SEX and just kind of see where it takes us. Uh, but never like a three-way faction deal. I, uh, I do want to ask about the name of Vince Russo's outfit, SEX sports entertainment, extreme uh, your dad comfortable with that? I mean, he signed off on TNA, I guess. Yeah. Double entendre. It was, yeah. you know, that, that, that was kind of the, the mindset in, in that, um, you know, I, I can't say it was a mandate, but, but kind of the, the mentality was it wasn't called, uh, sex. It was called SEX or sports entertainment extreme. So you didn't just, you know, hit them over the head with, with because that can, it, it almost, whether it's Mike Tanay or Don West, if you're saying sex, 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 all through the broadcast, it, 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 in a lot of ways becomes bad comedy. Lord, we yeah. know a lot about bad comedy, but it was sports entertainment extreme or SEX. It's written in the observer quote, Jerry Jarrett is orchestrating it and wants everyone to do interviews saying what they think. So the angle is built around real feelings. Russo believed most of what he said in his speech, where he said he thinks TNA sucks and that he came up with the name and it was supposed to mean tits and ass and WWE sucks. And the wrestling was dying before he got power and it's dying again. So now he's back to save it. The idea that your dad is, is cool with this. I mean, I, I know that your dad likes, uh, personal issues. You guys used to have a sign in the, in the old building, personal issues, draw money. I totally get that. And if it's real and we can blur the lines, I know personally, your dad likes that, but given his, well, hokey pokey relationship with Vince Russo, I'm surprised he's willing to give him this much latitude. No, no. And that's yeah. where, you know, when you, and this is something that I, I thought from a real macro level, we're going to get into the, 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 the we're going to go back in time and, and hear different opinions from Meltzer. And, and Keller and, and, and other journalists of the day that assumed we were trying to kayfabe everybody, that we were not telling different folks different things. And that's a real egotistical point of view in, in that, no, the, the kind of the industry in a lot of ways, um, look, you can't work the boys or, or try to do that week after week, but natural reactions are, are, are a big part of the, 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 uh, the magic of our industry. And, and, and also that, you know, my dad, him and Austin Idol had that love hate relationship and look from a, from a personal level, Mike McCord and Jerry Jarrett got along from a professional level. Sometimes they got along. Sometimes they didn't at all, but at the end of the day, my dad would give Austin Idol or whoever it may be. You can call it, you know, give them a lot of leash, give them a lot of rope, whatever it may be, because it's kind of best for business. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on, on this, and this is where kind of the, you talk about the lines ring being really blurred to this day. I think my dad would absolutely say Vince Russo can write with emotion and really pull it out of some folks in the same breath. He would say 
but he just doesn't understand the very fundamentals of the wrestling business. And then Vince Russo would say, yeah, but you don't understand about television ratings. And then it would go back to, but you know what? Uh, the, the business is going to die. Uh, you know, Vince, just all this kind of hogwash in the business. I just looked at WWE's stock and that company's uh, rolling. Well, they, yeah, supposedly third hour raw, which, which is terrible and ratings are up and down. It's still the, that industry, WWE, has never been worth more in its entire existence. So, look, it's the age old, you can debate and negotiate and talk this stuff in, in the ground. But um, as far as my dad giving him lead way, it's, it's what he thought was best for business because Vince was, is very passionate about his opinion on the business. It's his opinion. And my dad tipped his cap to that and, and kind of, no, he didn't kind of, this is what the story was going to be professional wrestling versus sports entertainment. You know, let me ask that because we've never really talked about that before, but do you think your dad was, was capable of seeing the macro better than Vince and Vince was really worried about the micro. Cause we only ever hear Vince talk about TV ratings, but your dad knew that, Hey, TV ratings are part of your business, but not all of it. I mean, there's a lot of our listeners who are really hardcore anti WWE and, and I get that. Hey man, watch what you watch. Enjoy what you enjoy. Uh, but there's no denying that that company started this year at under $50 a share. And right now they're hovering around 75 bucks. And you take a look at almost every other stock this year. Go compare WWE stock to Tesla or anything else. And man, it tells quite a different story. So they know what they're doing. And yes, it is true. I think, uh, last Monday, as you and I are recording this, they had the lowest hour in the history of raw on the third hour, but that's not, that doesn't tell the whole story of the business. So I'm, I'm choosing to use the words macro and micro. Do you think your dad maybe understood the macro maybe a little better than Vince? I'm absolutely positive. And that's kind of the thing that whether it's Vince or anybody Russo, not McMahon, it, whether it's Russo or anybody else, it's, it, it is the definition of humility, not thinking less of yourself, thinking of yourself less. Mm -hmm. Don't think that you just are going to see the world through your eyes. And Vince's eyes has all, he's always viewed things as a writer. My dad was fortunate enough or unfortunate enough or whatever it may be that his grand, his mother, my grandmother took a second job selling tickets. And so from his very first introduction, there was who cared what the angle was shot on TV, who cared who was in it. It was all about, we drew tonight or we didn't. Oh my God, we had a sell out house, but this talent costs this, 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 and this. So do we really don't profit what we did last week when we had half the amount of people in here and our, you know, our talent roster, all those kind of things. Vince has never really attempted to look at bottom line results. And in business, and Conrad, you can tell me better than this. That's all that matters. It is all that matters. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's silly to think otherwise. Let's talk about the creative here. Uh, Russo is going to do a promo saying that WWF management tried to bury Jeff Jarrett in the mid nineties and he quit to join WCW. And then he's going to claim in a promo that you begged him to get him back in the WWF. And once he did management, once again, tried to bury you. So Russo quote unquote made you again with the gimmick now of beating up women. And Russo is basically taking credit for even getting you to WCW again, making you champion. And Meltzer would say that's pretty much the case. And then Mike today would jump in and say that, you know, he blames Vince Russo for the death of WCW, but he was told specifically not to say what he really thinks about him. And Meltzer's kind of critical of this decision, but he says, quote, Jeff Jarrett believes the promotion needs to shock and surprise fans to garner attention. But if there's one lesson that should be learned over the past three years, it's the doing angles to shock the internet usually winds up with angles that make no sense and leads to storylines that make no sense and digs you into a deeper hole in the long run. And the idea here is Russo is telling the fans that he's the baby face in the feud. And most people would probably view him as the heel. And I know that he's trying to blur the lines and I don't know this to be certain, but I feel like Russo was probably one of those first adopters of the old phrase that we've all heard. Now there's no more black and white. It's just shades of gray. Do you think Russo adopted the shades of gray mentality? and is 
Meltzer spot on that you think what the company needs to is to shock and surprise fans to get some attention. Uh, so, uh, question one, Vince absolutely believes in that philosophy. I think to a fault it, it's look in life. There's not all wearing, you know, I'm using the old illustration of black hats and white hats. Of course, there's different shades of gray. I mean, that, that goes without saying, but also, and, and look, you can say, oh, that was the South or that was the North or that was Philly or that was LA or that was a easy crowd. Vince was a heel to the people in that building when he, you know, rolled out his promo and his promo was his version of the truth. It's, it's what he believed and Mike today believed that. And so to second part of your, uh, question was uh, shock or surprise. It, it goes without saying absolutely. Any promoter wants to shock or surprise the, the theory of relativity is just this. If you shock them every week, it's no longer a shock. Hey, light bulb goes off. You know, it's, it, it, it is, it is timing the surprises and how you deliver a surprise or a shock. I think we're kind of wordsmithing here, but, but I think Dave Meltzer would, would, would say to this day or 20 years ago when he was talking is our promotion, our industry is built off the promotion of execution. And sometimes you have to surprise them. Sometimes you have to just flat out put them in the face and, and say, this is wrestler a and wrestler B in the main event, no surprises, no strings attached, then get them to the match. And in the match, give them a surprise finish. Our, our business is built on su shock and surprises. Well, there is a surprise at the end of this uh, show. The cliffhanger is, um, whether or not you're going to join Russo and you put your belt down on the mat and dare Russo to get it as Russo goes to get it, Ron killings jumps him. And then backstage afterwards, Ron <laughs> is complaining. Hey man, Russo was shooting on me, throwing real punches. And Meltzer says, I don't really believe that. I think this is just a way that they want us to report it and try to drum up interest. Is that accurate? You guys were trying to quote unquote work the boys or was Vince really untrained and trying to make it look good and punched him for real. And this is the great thing about Dave's journalism. I, I guess I'll call it. This is the great thing about Dave's journalism. Had Vince being untrained thrown phony punches, there would have been another headline. Russo exposes the business with his untrained deals. I'll give Vince Russo this. He knew he wasn't trained. So his only option was, and whether it was me talking to him or my dad or maybe Jerry Lynn in the house that night, whoever he's talking to, we all said, stay away from the eyes, stay away from the throat, stay away from the balls, wh whatever it is, flail them in. And you just got to swing for the fences and you got to beat the shit out of the guy, but, but, but don't hurt him. Well, Ron probably knew that was coming. It still don't feel good. And it's still an ass whooping. And so when he got through the curtain, I'm sure he was bitching and complaining and taking a lot of stiff shots, but Dave saying, this is what they want us to believe puts Dave's ego front and center. They, they, we're not writing to, 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 you know, for his headline, it's silliness, but, but I can see where Dave would take that. That's his journalistic approach. One of the ideas is we want to bring in some old timers since we've got sports entertainment. We want to bring in some names that maybe, uh, don't really like Vince Russo. And the observer mentions two names being bandied about were Roddy Piper and dusty Rhodes. And there's another name that's mentioned quote. There had been interest in Bobby Heenan. And I think there was some sort of an informal agreement where Heenan would come in at some point last week, Heenan changed his stance saying he doesn't want to be fooled into doing an angle that benefits Russo and said, if Russo was involved, he wouldn't work for the company, but he since softened that stance and is willing to do the angle for the right price. There's another name of similar sorts. Jeff Jarrett and Sean Waltman talked at length several times over the past week. Jarrett had been trying to smooth over problems between, uh, Waltman and the company where Waltman had issues, uh, with working with Russo for weeks while Waltman did quit over Russo. He didn't come back on 1127, which he wanted to be his job on the way out because he didn't want to do a tag match on his last match in TNA. 
and TNA management said they didn't want talent making so many demands on the booking. This is a real issue. Is it not? I mean, this, this Russo persona, whether it's right or wrong, is polarizing to old timers like Bobby Heenan and, you know, stars that are relatively fresh off TV, like Sean Waltman. Polarizing would be an understatement and Vince back to our, uh, earlier conversation. That's how Vince has made money. He was polarizing from day one in his success at, at the WWF. You know, it's polarizing to tell the boss, Vince McMahon, your writers suck or, or yeah. your bookers suck, whatever it is. That's kind of been Vince go to to be polarizing. Hats off to him. Um, you know, on one, well, on one hand, you can say a lot of sizzle, no steak. Well, eventually folks get hungry. You can't live off sizzle. You gotta, gotta have both. Uh, but yes, Heenan, um, I, I would say, uh, before his passing, um, one of his best friends walking the face of the earth was our lead announcer, Mike Tanay. So there was that relationship and Bobby let it be known. He did not enjoy his time professionally working with Vince Russo and did need it at the time and didn't see any upside, but you know, Mike leaned into him. I would imagine I leaned into him. We all leaned into him and he agreed to do it. Kind of understanding the, the lay of the land, uh, Sean Waltman kind of basically the same deal. I think Sean to take it a step further was much more aligned, um, you know, with my father and probably, went out of his way to support him due to their longstanding relationship. So, but yeah, polarizing is, is an understatement, but, um, that was what this whole thread and angle was built off. And I can remember talking internally. That's kind of the whole point guys that there there's a real night folks got to remember this is 2002, the word sports entertainment or, or out front. Uh, maybe Conrad, I wonder if there's a Wikipedia, when did sports, sports entertainment come into the, uh, vernacular in the day to day when uh, Vince McMahon didn't want to pay the tax in Jersey late eighties. Yeah. 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 Okay. But anyway, uh, that, that was the whole thread of this story. Reality based sports entertainment versus professional wrestling. It's one in the same, but people really like to, uh, jump on either side of the fence and it's fun discussion. It is fun discussion. Um, Meltzer would say that the whole Sean Waltman Russo thing is not an angle, but Jeff Jarrett wants it to be. I mean, and I guess that makes sense. I mean, that's how you were raised in the business that, that personal issues draw money. Let's talk about some of the other folks that are on the show, including low key. It's written here. Jerry Jarrett, after much prodding reversed fields on low key, and he was contracted to appear on the December 4th show as part of the X division elimination match. But they ended up putting easy money in the slot instead. I think you and I both uh, thought once upon a time. I mean, I did. I thought the first time I saw Loki, man, this guy's going to be a big star. It was a totally different presentation than anything I'd seen. But we've heard the story time and time again that it wasn't always the easiest to work with. What did your dad think of Loki? Look, uh, Brandon's a unique individual. And once my father gave it just a downbeat to kind of digest who Brandon Silvestri, who low key is as a human and is as a performer, he was on board. He, he saw it. Um, you know, there was gosh, a mighty, it, it's just such a different, it's just a, such a different era that then even in here, we're talking about 2002 than it was in 92, if you will. Um, it, you know, the independent scene and guys coming in and, you know, my, my, my original discussions with my father about the X division, he's like, ah, that's, that's, that's cruiserweights and, and, you know, go back to Nelson Royal or, you know, the NWA junior heavyweight champion, just by connotation, uh, you, you don't and ever that, want to, yeah. yeah, you don't want to say that just all that, you know, Bill Dundee was five, eight, whatever, hundred, 200 pounds. He never wanted to call Dundee uh, a junior heavyweight. He was you know, build superstar Dundee or whoever. He didn't like to put guys in buckets lesser than. And I said, that's my point. The X division, not about weight limits. It's about no limits. They're going to have a style of wrestling that the heavyweights aren't going to do. 
so it's the alternative. And so a lot of folks that came in and were in X division match, there was already a predisposition, my father included, like, oh, they're X guys. Well, wait a minute. Check out low key. He's a different cat. He, yeah. he, he can work his ass off. Well, there's uh, some other changes coming as a part of this Panda proposition, Meltzer would say. For those who thought the Panda Energy deal would mean an influx of money going in to upgrade, that doesn't look to be the case. Am I saying this right? His name correctly here, Chris Sobol? Sobol. Chris Sobol, who heads the fiscal side of things, has been looking at making production cutbacks because he's trying to decrease the budget. In particular, it looks like he wants the syndicated television show to have its budget cut. Ultimately, they are business people who will run it. If the numbers come out on the plus side, the contract within demand doesn't call for numbers to have to be released for the first show that they did in May of 2003. And since the numbers are so small, nobody's even bothering to get any kind of quick estimates like they do for shows expected to do well, like boxing or UFC events or the last WWE events. So talk to me a little bit about Chris Sobel. Is this the, the character you've mentioned before that, man, it was apparent right away. He was here to, uh, disrupt things. Well, disrupt probably the wrong and look, <clears throat> how I view Chris today, uh, opposed to how I viewed him in 2002, because, uh, he, he, Chris is British, um, you know, lived in Dallas at the time and came up here. I don't want to say every week, but it was every other week or what. I mean, it was a, a cadence, but right out of the gate, um, his, he's exactly what a venture capitalist, uh, bean counter you, you could suspect. He questioned everything and no matter what it was, how can we cut? And it was again, his diplomacy, his delivery, uh, was probably something that in my gut thought, I don't think Bob Carter would care for how he's handling things up here. I don't think he wants this tone. Look, he, w going into this, it was, here's the budget that we're working off of and here's what to expect. And here's kind of the path we're headed. And Chris came in and wanted to cut and find ways to cut and why are we spending here and why are we spending there? And, Boy, Dutch could probably have a few uh, stories. Uh, a couple of guys could have a couple of stories because it was, I, it wasn't comical at the time. But now that I look back on it, it's just like, geez, this guy—he just didn't understand. But as I said here today, why would he understand? He had zero idea of entertainment. Energy, sure, that's the field he came from. It's just two different. It's completely two different PLs uh, in so many ways. In the local television show had a tiny budget to begin with, uh, you know, cutting that is, I'm sure you can come up with a nice, uh, you don't make any money by, you don't make any headway in a business by cutting the small things. Don't get me wrong. The small things add up, but if you really need to make a dent in the budget, you got to cut at the top. Yeah. Not at the bottom. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, Scott Hall, he's, uh, going to be in a tough spot here. He's still in the mix here in, in TNA, but he's got a child custody case coming up. Uh, he's got a lot going on and I'm sure you're in a weird spot where you're trying to grow your business, but also be sensitive to real life family stuff that man, you've had to deal with. I'm not necessarily custody, but you get where I'm going. Like personal stuff is a part of this. And, uh, these guys are not just people you do business with, but really lifelong friends too. Yeah. And Scott. I mean, it's so documented in so many different, you know, Scott had his challenges in life and, um, you can call them demons, whatever it may be, but me and Scott had our relationship. And so always aired, we covered it a couple of weeks ago. I mean, Kevin, I'm sure blindly overlooked things we shouldn't have as our relationship with Scott, but it came from a spirit and of a hope that we're going to help Scott and, you know, Scott on a bad day is, uh, still pretty damn good, uh, to, to have as a part of a wrestling organization. You're going to defend the world title against Ron killings. Meltzer would say you guys had a three-star match that went nearly 14 minutes, but you go to a double count out, which makes the audience groan. So Bob Armstrong playing sort of the commissioner at the time comes out and says, they're not going to have a main event match in like that. Uh, so there you go. We restart the match. You get it after three strokes. 
Uh, Russo would also do an interview, an interview on this program and say that, uh, Mike today threatened to quit if he came back and Meltzer would say, that's not the case, but the torch ran a story that basically said, here's all the people who might quit if Russo comes back. And, uh, Mike today was one of those. So we're, we're sort of blurring the lines and, and leaning into what the quote unquote dirt sheets are saying. Let's talk about Ron Killings and Bullet Bob, though. First, how did you think Bullet Bob did as an as an on air commissioner type? We saw that once before with Smoky Mountain. We're seeing it again here. Yeah, Bob knows how to deliver. Um, hell of a worker in his day, but even in in these days, but he knew how to to deliver. He knew the role of an authority figure was to get the promotion over and at times take a bullet for the promotion. He just, he, he knew the role great. Uh, oh, so well. And you know, with my close relationship with the whole family, uh, it was a no brainer, but, uh, man, Bob could deliver the right kind of promo at the right time. Uh, in so many ways. Tell me about Ron killings. He was one of the first guys. I mean, when you ran your first show here at the Von Braun center, right down the street from my house. I went with my, my uncle and we both came away thinking, Hey man, that guy's going to be a star when you're in the ring with him. Could you tell he might not be all the way shined up yet, but he's going to be a big dog on star in this business. Charisma, charisma, charisma. He just meeting him backstage for 15 seconds. Uh, his infectious smile, his infectious personality. You just, you can't manufacture that. My dad thought we all knew that then get him in the ring and his athletic ability is light years ahead of, of, of guys. And then his ability as a performer, and I'm, I'm saying not just wrestling music or j- just delivering promos. And this is something that yes, you can teach it. And I have found over time. But some folks at a very baseline right out of the gate know how to listen to an audience and feed off of them. Ron could do that. And, and so, you you know, he, he checked every box. Uh, I don't even want to put it like that because he, he just, you know, uh, when I look back on different things in my career, that's one of the things that, that you, a lot of people, it's not even in their thought process. Oh, that guy's a good listener. And Conrad, I put that at the very, very top. If you can, if you can learn to listen to the audience, they'll tell you, they absolutely will tell you. Let's talk a little bit about your, uh, vacation. If you will, even though you're here running for T running TNA and fighting for your life and trying to keep the nose up on this thing, as we like to say around these parts. You head to Glasgow, Scotland for a pay-per-view taping with the WWA. It's going to air in February. And on this tour, Lex Luger would win the title from sting. When you hit sting with a guitar that barely breaks. And then you even wind up wrestling Nathan Jones and retain the NWA title before he's supposed to start with WWE. It didn't go well. Meltzer would say this. He was really green and ended up giving both disco and Jarrett black eyes. And Jarrett needed stitches in his eye after getting potatoed. Jarrett ended up spending two hours in the hospital and getting six stitches in his eye after taking either a clothesline or an elbow to the eye from Nathan Jones. A lot to unpack here. First of all, talk me through the, um, is there more at hand when you're doing this WWA tour than just being a performer on the card? Are you also having conversations? with talent like Lex Luger and sting and some of the other folks that you may be on this tour with. And secondly, what do you remember about Nathan Jones sending you for a little medical care? Oh, Marcus it's online. Find the big Beal out of the corner. Uh, from Nathan. <laughs> there, there's a funny one. It says, uh, I, 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 the, the Twitter, somebody posted, this is a while ago said, I bet Jeff Jarrett felt this and I, responded or quote to it. I still feel it today. He tossed me Conrad. Well, I'll go ahead and answer the Nathan Jones. He tossed me, he billed me from <clears throat> one corner to the other. He, it was, um, just crazy kind of strength, almost Mongo sh- strong, but he billed me. He's so damn tall. He launched me up in the air and just, it was, uh, 
is brutal. Uh, but how you can, how his elbow can catch my eye and potato me three or four times in a very short match. But yeah, he split. It was just like a, a, a cut right over the eye, right on the bone. It just sliced it open real good. And going to a hospital in Scotland, I love my Scottish fans over there. Shout out, Grado. Uh, but man, it was brutal. A cold, damp, wet hospital and had to wait and had to wait some more and got to get it cleaned up because there was nobody at the building that, and I, I knew it was deep enough that if I don't get this sewed up, it's, it's bad scar, real easy for infection, blah, 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 blah. So Conrad, two hours, my ass is about four or five hours. It was brutal. Any, uh, any hurt feelings towards Nathan Jones or did you no, know, no, he just no. don't know any better. No, no. I mean, there was, it would happen. It was an accident. I mean, it's not like, no, it was, is a potato, but it was, uh, a nice little Scottish hospital uh, stay. But um, back to your, the first part of that question was that the, obviously we're talking six months into to TNA and Andrew McManus, I had agreed verbally, uh, you know, he, he had these tours booked out and I wasn't exactly sure where McManus was headed with things. I knew that it was coming to an end, uh, but Look, I can talk to Lex or Sting or anybody else on that card. I can talk to them at home. Uh, the the main gist is I wanted to get over to the UK and talk to the different promoters and see the appetite. You, you got to remember. So from really early nineties till during the total attitude era, whether it was Germany or the UK, super successful live event tours and. With WCW out of business, we, you know, the early days were, okay, we're going to be the alternative. And WWE uh, is going to run their, you know, April and November tours, if you will. And that's it. So is there a market to bring an all-star card just like Andrew was doing, but, you know, with, with some uh, of the TNA folks? And so that was definitely on my agenda to go to the UK to talk to different promoters that could be interested in promoting wrestling. While we're over there, you make a shot in Manchester and uh, it's a 17,000 seat arena. There's 3000 folks here. You're going to team with buff Bagwell, take on sting and Lex Luger. And the idea here is you'd lose the NWA title and Lex would lose the WWA title. So of course sting pinned buff, um, were you surprised that Mr. McManus was able to pull all this talent together? Or did you know, before you even got on the plane, my man's going to lose some money on this show. Well, I mean, Manchester, it's the, he went to the biggest buildings there. And yeah. you think about the number, I right? grew through 3000 people. You can create profit off of that, but not in a 17,000 seat arena. Uh, just difficult. So. Uh, yeah, I knew that it was an uphill battle at this stage. You got to remember how long, you know, I had worked with him. What was the first tour? Uh, at this point, I was a year into the relationship uh, around that. I, I knew that, uh, yeah, it was going to be an uphill battle. You were going to do the match in Belfast before you head back home to TNA. Of course, man, it feels like you're all over the place, which makes me think of our brand new sponsor, Camper Max. I'm excited to introduce you all to a brand new family opportunity of building memories year round camper max specializing in max discounted pricing on travel trailers and fifth wheel RVs delivered anywhere in the lower 48. That's right. From your office, your cell phone, or your couch, you can click or call and find out how easy it is to start enjoying the RVing lifestyle. How easy is it? Well, the camper max discount will fit any budget offering easy financing with extended terms. It really is just too easy. Visit CamperMax.com. That's C-A-M-P-E-R-M-A-X-X.com. CamperMax with two X's.com. Or call 256-320-7033. And be sure to mention my name, Conrad. To get the old friend of a friend deal you're going to love. Camper Max. It's the home of the Max discount. And I want to mention... If you're looking to purchase a motorhome, hang in there. My longtime friend Rod is working on that now. This is a real deal friend of the show, but he is now delivering 
in anywhere in the United States, the lower 48, he can hook you up, man. Travel trailers, fifth wheel RVs, whatever you're looking for. In fact, I think Rod even buys them too. Check it out. Campermax.com. C-A-M-P-E-R-M-A-X-X.com. Give him a ring. 256-320-7033. Be sure to mention my name, Conrad. It's going to get you that friend of a friend discount. To get you back on the road, daddy. Uh, let's get the show back on the road here. I would like me to give him a call. Hey, man, I'm well, telling you, he's been my friend in business for 13 years now. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, every time you've seen me uh, take a, an RV to Chicago for one of our wrestling shows or to Dallas or whatever, Rod was the guy who made it happen. Okay. Now I'm connecting dots. I mean, he's hooked us up for tailgates and he knows his stuff. He's been doing it for decades. Hell of a good dude. You're going to love him. It's Rod Wagner, campermax.com, M A X X, two X's, and campermax.com. Let's talk about why we're really here, man. As we start to wind down 2002, there's a pretty controversial promo that happens. Mm. It's the December 4th show. It's going to cause a major stir. It's a supposed unscripted Vince Russo, Roddy Piper confrontation. And Meltzer would say it probably would have just been the normal nonsense, except Piper claimed that Russo was the person who killed his cousin, Owen. Russo came out and there was an uncomfortable looking situation, but management at this stage is working. Everyone with these supposed shoots. Piper came in with no advertising at his insistence to get the surprise big pop. In other words, whatever economic value there was in Piper's first appearance in years coming off his book tour was negated completely. He gave an interview running down Russo. Russo came out in the middle, acting cocky in the corner and not selling for Piper, but not really saying anything. After the situation, which ended with the crowd dead, Russo came out for a few minutes later on his own interview and yelled at Piper for using Owen Hart's death to sell books. This was definitely a work on mostly everyone. I believe aside from the Jarrett's Piper and Dave Penzer, that only Bob Ryder and Jeremy Borash, both of whom figured out because I don't know that either were told that in the last hour before the show, when they went on the air, even Piper was there. He was kept hidden. Mike today was not aware of it at the time. And the script for the show mentioned neither Piper's interview nor Russo's comeback. And the claim is that Russo also didn't know that Piper was going to be there. And he went out on his own to confront Piper. Piper claimed he had no idea Russo was coming out. However, this was at least planned to be the start of a series of appearances by Piper where he would feud with Russo. So you do the math. Piper himself, after the fact, claimed he was mad at Russo for being unprofessional and interrupting his interview, but he held the Jarrett's blameless, and this was a one-shot, and he's not coming back. Time will tell on that one, but if he isn't, it makes this even more mind-boggling. Jeff, this is one of the biggest head-scratchers in TNA history, so I want to start from the beginning. Did you, based on your understanding, have an agreement, whether it's on paper, a verbal, a handshake, whatever, for Piper to do multiple appearances for TNA. When I looked into the research, I'm like, oh, we're covering this too. I kind of just smiled and chuckled. And I'm like, has this story ever been told? No. I don't think it has. And let me ask you, Conrad, have you ever heard of Penzer's version of the story? No. Okay. So, mm, uh, and when I read Dave's uh, comments, <clears throat> It, it, because look, Mike today and, and, uh, Dave Meltzer got a relationship as well. So here's the, the set point. Did we have anything in writing? No. Roddy Piper wrote a book and was on a book tour. Dave Penzer was running point on the book tour, basically his tour manager, if you will, or point person They had a stop in Nashville. They were staying out on the hill by air, uh, by the airport at the Marriott. That's where the bus was parked. So we had been in communication. I'm not going to say there was a long line of weeks, if not months. So maybe a month or three weeks. Hey, we're going to be in Nashville. If it's on a Wednesday, Piper wanted to go sell books. That, that, that was, I don't say one and only priority because later did I found out, boy, he did have an agenda. But that's how the whole conversation came up. Of course, when they reach out, hey, Roddy was going to be in Nashville. 
What about him coming on the show free of charge? Free of charge. Yeah, we're selling books. Okay. Well, Roddy, you know, if you're going to come in and you're insistent on being a surprise, great. We're going to get a, a buzz. Roddy Piper was on this show and everything that goes with it. But I'd like to have the ability to set up something. I'm not saying a match or, or maybe it is a match. Uh, but you know, a return, a special referee, something that we can promote on a Wednesday night pay-per-view that Rowdy Roddy Piper will be on, you know, uh, TNA Wednesday night episodes. And, you know, when you go back to the late eighties and, and see Piper's work, when he was red hot, you talk about polarizing and knew how to get heat, knew how to perform and all that. I think his WCW days were, were not red letter days, but, but that goes without saying, but having Piper, a part of the show, the legendary name, you know, kind of the, the, the pillars, if, if you will, of sports entertainment. So him coming in was, I'm all for it. And so I drove out, I think on Tuesday, the day before, uh, the show and we kind of talked through it, but Roddy was kind of insistent on, I want it to be a surprise. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go to the ring and uh, we talked about different things that were on the show and he wanted to give his basically kind of his, I can remember us using these words, Roddy, you're going to give us your state of the union of the wrestling industry. No word of Owen Hart, no word of, of, of Vince Russo to, in, in detail that, you know, Vince is a heel and SEX and you kind of give your opinion on that, but none of this Owen talk or any of that, Roddy, go get over and do a dynamite promo in, in, in our viewpoint. And my father was, all right, it's three to five minutes of a two hour surprise promo. If it goes seven big deal. And I'm sure we padded knowing that he could go along and, and let him go talk and, and just see what he comes with. Cause he's going to be entertaining. And, and he assured us, I've got an end point. I'll wrap it up. I'm going to put, put the promotion over, you know, Wednesdays will never be the same. Anything can happen. That whole kind of mentality. So Conrad, that was the mindset and Roddy wanted to keep it quiet. And, you know, again, the, the ego talking from the dirt sheets were, oh, we're, we're working the boys. no. The fairgrounds had public works people. They had, we had people, we'll call it not smart to the business or not a part of our day to day business. So right. we didn't advertise everything. We wanted it to be a surprise to the arena, to the fans, that if they saw Roddy hanging around at 5 30 or 6, he's not that big a surprise when his music hits. There's already right. going to be a buzz, already going to be waiting. So we wanted it to be a surprise across the board to the fans and, and, and get a big, pop the arena wise because it'll make good tv that was the whole mindset of, of roddy appearing so when he goes to the ring and let me back up you got to know the sports arena um when you look at and and i hope this is is this on impact plus yeah absolutely it is yeah, yeah. so folks if you want to kind of see no if, if you want to see unscripted surprise you want to see a man go to the ring and then figure out, I just jumped over this fence and I don't know what in the hell to do, but that's what happened because, uh, Piper came to the ring, did his promo and at the sports arena, like I said, is SEX, um, at the kind of the whole storyline was they are not heels or baby faces. They're dressing in a dressing room that's across the way. So the dressing rooms were decided were, were divided completely. So, and I don't even know who we clued in. I don't, I'm sure today we clued in and Don West. I don't know who else we clued in. I, I, I don't know if I told Vince he was coming or not. It's not like we were trying to hide it from the people, you know, the truck knew I mean, it, 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 we weren't, but we just kept it quiet because of the fans. Hey, imagine that trying to make a real surprise. So Piper went to the ring and when he started his promo, but when he started dropping the stuff on Owen, it surprised everybody, my father, me, everybody backstage. And it didn't sit right as it came out, but we're nope. like, okay, let's get through this. Well, Vince on the other side of the building Obviously, it struck a nerve with him. And so there he goes. 
he takes off down to the ring and gets in the ring. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. He, you didn't know he was going to the ring to do this. He just quote unquote, went into business for himself and did it. Just like Roddy went into business for himself. So did Vince. My goodness. It's good team. Go, go, watch it. I mean, it's, it, <laughs> you talk about the wild, wild West. I just assumed it was part of it. Like it was like, well, Hey, you got to go out there and correct that. By the way, you can watch this on impactwrestling.com forward slash packages. You want to sign up with the promo code Jeff and, uh, man, it's only seven ninety nine a month. You get all these old classic shows that we're talking about here. And we got something special when you sign up, we're going to be doing towards the end of the year. You don't want to miss it. Uh, we've never done it before. And it's going to be for everyone who has uh, taken our word for how great this content is over on impact plus it's impactwrestling.com forward slash packages. Be sure to use that promo code, Jeff. You don't want to miss out on what we've got up our sleeves. So listen, I, I can only imagine how you must have felt. Of course, we've covered on this program, especially in the archives, how close you were with, uh, with Owen Hart. And it does feel whew, a little less than to, uh, uh, a little it's, it's in poor taste. We shouldn't have done it. And, but Roddy Piper had crazy ideas that were sort of in poor taste before. And, and it's been whispered about in wrestling behind the scenes and, and, and MMA behind the scenes about, Hey, you should say this. And you should say that. I think Roddy Piper really did subscribe to the theory of, uh, there's no such thing as bad press. You know, if people are talking about oh. you get to win, but my goodness, uh, the Owen Hart thing. I wish we had that one back. I'm sure everybody felt a certain type of way about it. I understand Russo feeling like, Hey, I don't want that to be the final word on this, but when we're doing this sort of thing, it, it derails us and gets us off track from what we're actually here to do. So maybe yeah. in hindsight, it wasn't the best idea for Piper, but now we understand why he wasn't advertised. He was free and it was his request. And now maybe we understand that maybe he wasn't supposed to be here long-term and, no. uh, we wanted, let, let me just say something on this. Uh, I read something on Twitter though, over the weekend about some guys listen to this on, on different things. And the reason, you know, I, I'm saying internally in the business, but this to me is a perfect example of producing yourself. Roddy obviously had it in his mind. This is going to be a great, this is going to sell books. This is going to be a, a great move. This is going to make this promo just, I, I'm sure Roddy talked him in himself into thinking there, this is all upside and no downside. Yeah. And that's the danger of producing yourself. It, well, said. It, Mr. It, it just nuked everything and everybody to me for the entire two hours. You just couldn't get that bad. I mean, it hurt me personally, but, but, but from a business perspective, horrible. And, and by the way, uh, I'm not, I don't think, I think you are too. I don't think either one of us are picking on Roddy Piper here. I, I love Roddy to the, I mean, I still Conrad, this phone right here, you want to keep here. And this is a, a new one, but I've still got a voicemail from Roddy Piper. He called me wow. two days before he passed away I, for whatever reason. I'm, Maybe more, but but I love Roddy. Rod, Roddy yeah. did some stuff at GFW, but Rod, Roddy loved the lineage of the business. Yes, in so many different ways, and you know, you 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 think about him on WrestleMania one, and you know his battles and just his his mindset and and the Don Owen and and but Roddy had he wore his emotions on his sleeve, a super human being look we all have our falls we all have our up and downs Th that that's my point i love roddy and i truly believe roddy really thought this needs to be said coming from me and there's a real upside to it and he, he could not have been more wrong but he produced himself that's where i was getting a minute ago is producing yourself is something that you and i have talked a lot about because even when we were putting together stuff or Ric Flair's last match. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but you've been doing this your whole life. And you would say, Hey, produce me. And I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> and I only remember one time right before we opened doors in Nashville, we're all sort of talking to Karen and, and Jay about, okay, on the pre-show, we're going to have you guys come out and do a promo and you're running down the bullet points. Cause we're not going to script anything. It's not WWE, but Hey, here's kind of the gist. 
and you go, all right, Karen, and you come out and just promise that, Hey, Ric Flair said I was willing to die in the ring. Just go ahead and say, we're going to kill him. And that Ric Flair is going to die tonight. And then you move on and I go, Hey, I don't think we want to say that. Maybe <laughs> not that. And you're like, what? He's been saying it in the promo. We're just, I'm like, no, no, we can't. Karen, don't say Rick's going to die on pay-per-view. That would be good if we would not say that. And Jay goes, I'm with Conrad. Maybe we don't say he's going to die. And I was like, okay, let's soften it up. Ric Flair says he's willing to die. And we're going to try to give him his wish. Okay. But don't just look at the camera and say, Rick Flair will die. Tonight. <laughs> but again, oh. you didn't say that from a place of, I want to kill Rick Flair. Well, it's a matter of, well, this is the story. Yeah. Okay. Let's pull it back just a little bit, maybe a little bit. Uh, so I think Roddy probably just got caught up in the moment and thought, well, this will, cause this is really the way I feel and blah, blah, blah. And this will get them talking. But as Meltzer said, it was not only tame, uh, tasteless, but stupid beyond words. And this jumped off the page to me. I had not heard this before. Check this out. This is a direct quote from the observer. However, WCW did something similar with Piper and Russo in 99. When Russo attempted to try and use Owen's death for a storyline with Bret Hart walking around near the ceiling at Kemper arena for a nitro event that Hart ended up not appearing on. The whole deal is that without television, their feeling is they need to do something to get attention and get people talking. Of course, we've seen that thought process in both WWE and WCW and more often than not, it ends up being to the detriment of the company. So I had never heard ever that Vince Russo wanted Bret Hart to walk around the ceiling where his brother fell from in WCW. That just jumped off the page to me. What? Who's doing that? Never heard that. I, I never heard that. I, I, I still think about, uh, no, no coincidences, only convergences May pay-per-view, uh, 99 Owen tragically passes away May 2000 WCW pay-per-view, obviously different companies. I'm in that triple cage and climb 60 something feet. It just, yeah, but I never heard, uh, I never heard that proposal, uh, or suggestion of Piper Russo and WCW. Never. I hope that's not real. I can't imagine who's going to be the guy to say, Hey, Brett, here's what we got today. What? Yeah. No chance, man. I don't think so. Um, Meltzer would say this too, uh, on the heels of you doing this WWA tour, maybe you're thinking of taking pay-per-views on the road and Meltzer would warn not a good idea that it's difficult right now in wrestling to sell more than a few hundred tickets, unless you're WWE. And at least in Nashville, you've got a routine down with papering and at least there's guys and an audience that's familiar with it. But instead of looking at the 5,000 seat arenas that Meltzer says you're looking at, maybe you should instead be looking at places that hold 600, 1200 which again, is going to be a money loser. That story just doesn't feel like it can be real, Jeff. And I'm not trying to say that it's fiction. I'm not going to be a, a Jeff Jarrett on this program today about the report. Oh, stop it. You, you. But if we're saying Chris Sobel's in slashing the budget and then a couple pages later, Hey, now they're trying to take the show on the road. Well, as my dad would say that don't G haul, how can we cut the budget and then add new expenses? That didn't make any sense. Right? Of course. Conrad, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot or back you in a corner here, but if you, if, if I were to, I'm going to ask you, what do you think is at the top of my duties at AEW? Top of my duties, not wrestling, not, not in ring behind the scenes. Uh, digging out profit in new areas. Well, okay. Live events. I mean, we, yeah. that's kind of, Tony tweeted that. Okay. So. I was, I didn't, I didn't think I could say that. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, well, he tweeted, <laughs> he tweeted a lot. You know, okay, he, I missed the tweet, but I, I, in my head, like when people think of Jeff Jarrett, it's they not only think of live events with baseball stadiums and all the GFW stuff, but also all the international. So what I, what I kind of call that in my country speak is found money. Yeah. Like this is something that we can, we got these guys under contract. Let's do something. Let's generate new revenue. So whether it was Japan and I went over to Japan, I went to the UK for Andrew McManus. Uh, different sh shots. I, I knew that we're Wednesday night, only Wednesday night. Well, we we were we building a, incredible equity in AJ and and others. Not out of the gate, but it was a kind of a stepping stone. What I was hopeful of is to help get these guys out on the road and get them shows and get them bookings and get the exposure because you know. TNA is the, is the brand, but AJ Styles is a sub-brand. Uh, you know, SEX is a sub-brand. Um, 
Chris Daniels, Triple X, Elix Skipper, all the talent that are on a show, whether it's AEW or WWE, they're all sub brands of the main main brand. And so I was hoping to create an, uh, the 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 uh, the potential or the possibility of get these guys out on the road to 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 get dates and get booking. And what I found fascinating when you hear Meltzer say. Unless you're the WWE, you're only drawing, I think he said four, five, 300 fans. Think about how times have changed. Remove WWE and AEW. I'm talking about, okay, GCW. What was Hammerstein? I mean, you know, th there's a lot of independent shows that are doing, I'll say north of a thousand. So, Russo, the business ain't dead like you thought it would be. <laughs> but no, you know, but I, I, I found it in 2002. Uh, I found it pretty. I don't say ironic, but man, the business was the, 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 the hard ticket sales of the business in 2002 were rough. Well, let's talk about, uh, what you're doing about all that. And it's, uh, this big storyline where we're going to have sort of sports entertainment versus old school wrestling. It's written that there's an edict that they are not supposed to, they being Mike Tanay or Vince Russo don't say Jerry Jarrett by name because we're still trying to find who that other persona is going to be and we've had bob armstrong as our sort of half-assed authority figure but it's being discussed that we need some sort of new blood brought in maybe it's dusty Rhodes, maybe it's jj dylan um maybe it's dutch mantel there's lots of names that are discussed and Meltzer would say that's going to be a problem because in wcw they had representation with old pencil pushers like jj dylan that the younger fan base enjoys seeing beat up. So it made WCW uncool compared to the NWO's opportunity to be cool. And as you're trying to find who that next person could be, Bill Moody debuts on the show using his old Percy Pringle name. But of course he still looks like Paul bear. Meltzer would say he used to be a regular as a heel manager. And they're looking for a big guy for him to manage. And malice has been discussed. Unfortunately, that will make malice appear to be a low rent undertaker because of the similar size and red hair. What'd you think of bringing in bill Moody, who had been at odds at different times with both the undertaker and the WWE and man, you got another, another Southern boy here on the program. How does this come to be? Oh, me and old Billy Moody, but Mel, I always go back to Percy days. He was, uh, at world-class on the end. Um, you know, he was, that's where we, we used to have a blast out in Texas and Percy smartened me up to the nuances of WCCW, whether it's the Von Eriks, whether it's the Sportatorium, whatever the dynamics were, he was obviously Eric Embry's friend, but also coworker and Percy, we kind of hit off our relationship and friendship in those days. Uh, man, what a fascinating life story. And him, you know, not working uh, for the WWE at the time, incredibly recognizable face and talent uh, at this time. Unfortunately, he had put on a lot of weight. Uh, Percy always kind of had a yo-yo uh, on his weight. But, uh, shoot, I was tickled to death to get him. Didn't really know exactly how we were going to navigate uh, storylines or who he's going to be with or, or, or his interest in all of it because – goes without saying he had been to the mountaintop and then some, uh, but, um, but yeah. Oh, Percy Pringle. What facials that guy. Unbelievable. Incredible performer. Uh, speaking of incredible performers, Jerry Lynn and amazing red both get injured. Uh, Lynn is, um, is, is a staple here. Cornerstone of the X division at this point, you're just starting to get some momentum with AJ and amazing red and red goes down too. Speaking of guys going down, we see a TV main event. It's Ron and Don Harris. They're Russo's guys here, and they're going to lose to you in a handicap match. And after the match, Ron Killings is going to come out. And eventually, BG James is going to do uh, an injury angle, and he's supposed to be your partner here. But he does a run-in, turns against his father, hits Ron with a chair, and starts hugging Russo. BG James, your old pal, the road dog. He's now a part of the SEX stable and he really is sports entertainment. I know his family is old school professional wrestling, but he became a big star in WWE doing 
sports entertainment stuff. So maybe it makes sense, but it's an opportunity for you to work against him. That's gotta be fun for you guys. No. Yes. But I mean, when you go to the authenticity of the storyline and look, bullet, Bob, hell of a promo, hell of a worker, Brad, hell of a worker, Stevie, Scotty, all good workers. But out of the four boys, it goes without saying. And just as of late, I, I, you know, old road dog uh, ruffled some feathers when he got into the Bret Hart conversation. But but as far as what he believes, he truly believes in the sport entertainment slant of things. Um, just kind of the balance of the roster. But it was it was reality based that he wanted to be on the SEX side, and that's the angle we shot to switch him heel. It's fun stuff, man. And I know you guys are having a blast with it, but then you read them and weep because boy fans are not happy when the chatter starts about what happened with uh, Roddy Piper. Mm. And I know originally you guys were probably thinking it would be some internet talk. I don't think anybody really understood what Piper was going to say, but a lot of people are saying they're fed up with the promotion over using Owen Hart in a wrestling angle. Meltzer would say, we ended up with our smallest response to a show in a long time. 20 people gave it thumbs up. 16 people gave it thumbs down zero in the middle. Do you remember there being a noticeable dip in purchases of the pay-per-view? Like, could you tell that buys were down after the Owen thing, or is that just a story for the observer? I don't remember business being down the thing that I can't, I mean, you know, buy rates being noticeably down it's december november no when was that i'm just trying to think of the date it, it felt like it was in q3 or q4 this is december yeah but he, here's kind of the way look it, and that's a part of this podcast the my world podcast is that we go back 20 years from now but then i can go back 19 and 18 and 17 and 16 and conrad i can tell you that promo that roddy delivered was one of those situations that from an internal perspective, not just in the creative room, but in the marketing room or the PR or to Dixie's defense and anybody on her team, it was one of those situations that you earmark. We don't want that. We, we don't want to go any, not just the, 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 I, I'm not saying the Owen horrible that was said, but the distasteful, stink funk because that's all anybody they they connotated roddy and 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 that promo to him uh fairly or unfairly and you know you you've joked about um channel changers uh you know even with me about me yeah. and all the different things you know I, I i do have a belief that i i don't think people see a talent go down the 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 ramp and say i'm changing the channel i don't think uh you see a matchup or a phony punch or a phony phony angle i do think a fan can hear gratuitous language or a comment made that's really distasteful like this uh and i think it's an accumulation that it puts a bad taste in their mouth and it is not a conscience, but sometimes a subconscious response that you gravitate away from the product. I, I, I do think it was that distasteful and that out of left field and folks, this ain't a plug, but if you want to kind of get the nature of it, go back and watch it because Russo coming down the ring and Piper had blistered him and him not doing anything, just standing there. And it became even more uncomfortable, which again, shined an even brighter light on the situation. Yes. I think it, 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 it exponentially made things worse. I get why Vince down there. He didn't like that. He said it. I don't think it was, I, I think it was bad taste. I don't think it's truthful, but that what was said, it just, th th there was, that's, that was really bad TV. It's the kind of stuff that I believe a sponsor watching the program, and I'm not saying it can be UFC, Bellator, WWE, AEW, Impact, MLW, whatever it is, you put off that kind of product and that kind of vibe, 
that's when the sponsors go, I want nothing to do with that. And no matter what, I'm not coming back to it. That's the kind of thing that, 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 that segment was a, a career lesson for me. And internally, that's what I'm saying is we talked about this for years to come on. This is what we don't want to do. Well, here's what we do want to do in the new year and that's save money. And boy, we can do that at savewithconrad.com. You know, it's Christmas time, man. And, uh, a lot of people are putting Christmas on a credit card. And after the first of the year, we're going to say, Hey, how do I pay for all that? And it's been said that it could take up to six months to pay off that Christmas credit card debt. Don't do that. Give us a shout right now at savewithconrad.com. We're going to show you how to get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this. We're routinely helping our, our podcast listeners here say five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you can do this right now. And we're getting five star reviews left and right. Check this one out from Michelle C. Everything from beginning to end was great. I knew what was going on throughout the entire process. Jamie was helpful and easy to work with. The entire team was, uh, here's another one here. Michael leaves us a five-star review. Larry got the job done. And that's the most important thing to me. I would definitely recommend him. What about down to the Palm coast? Another five-star report here. Uh, this one comes to us from Matthew. Lots of great communication, starting with Francis at the beginning and the great communication carried over to Diane and Jennifer to help get everything finalized. Diane really helped me make sure I had the right documents, especially when it came to dealing with divorce paperwork that was needed for a refi. Great team effort. No matter your circumstance, we want to help you keep more of your own money. And let me just give you this little reminder. If you're still renting, rent goes up every year. Have you ever even heard of a landlord coming to you and say, you know what? We've been charging too much. We're going to take the rent down next year. That is not the case. It never happens but you can always refinance and get a better rate. And we can help you do that right now. Get a cheaper monthly payment, keep more of your own money and you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this. Again, it's no cost, no obligation. If we can't save you some cash, we won't waste your time, but right here during the holidays, now's the time to do it. Consolidate all that debt. Use that newfound equity. All of a sudden your house is worth more than ever. These last couple of years, if you could pay all of that off and save six, seven, eight, even a thousand dollars a month, why wouldn't you do that? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. Get a cheaper payment, y'all. Savewithconrad.com. Hey, so let's talk about some other news and notes here. On December 11th, the show's kind of relatively calm. Uh, you're going to pin Kurt Henning. Vince Russo is going to hit him with a couple of guitar shots. It doesn't break the guitar either time. He got better with that as the days went on. Sonny Siaki is going to take the X division title off of Jerry Lynn. Of course he's injured. And in the process, a mystery woman makes her debut. Uh, it's categorized as dusty Rhodes protege, Kim Nielsen, who we know eventually becomes desire. We don't spend a lot of time talking about her on the program, but man, it looked like she had a ton of potential, right? Oh, huge. Yes. She her injured injuries prevented her, her career from taking off. I, I think it's that simple. You're going to do a sit down interview with Mike today here, and you're going to address some things. And Meltzer would say, it didn't seem like he knew how, and he really said mostly nothing, but he said that he thought Sean Waltman was using Russo as an excuse for quitting. He even called him a coward for not confronting Russo. And then talked about him missing two shows. Jarrett had talked with Waltman this past week. And while Waltman told him he's got no interest in coming back and working the angle, Jeff still believes that eventually he will come back. When addressing Piper, he bent over backwards to not say anything bad about Piper, just saying he's an old timer who worked very hard for what he got and that he truly hates Russo. He didn't want to talk about Owen Hart during a wrestling TV show, other than to say that nobody was responsible for him dying. I mean, I guess you kind of just had to say something here, right? I mean, did you feel like this is almost necessary? Hey man, we need to let everybody know that not it. I, I, I man, I wish I, I'd love to ask Mike today's recollection because I feel like Mike would have said, now, look, I may be way off base. I feel like Mike would have said, Hey, Jeff, let's address this. And what's your real thoughts? And I'm like, Mike, you, you know, it, I, I don't, I like, I mean, even up until the last year, I didn't like to tell Owen rib stories. I like to talk about the man he was, in that context, because I thought that's the message, you know, it's not a wrestling storyline, blah, 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 blah. I'm not, not going there, but Mike probably talked me into it or we collaborated on it or, 
you know, maybe my father had a say in it. I just, I don't remember, but I feel like, Hey Jeff, your relationship with Owen, you need to address it somehow. And yes. that's probably the result of addressing it. Let's talk about Vince Russo. Russo's telling friends here that he's not happy the day of this show, December 11th, because apparently you wanted to quote unquote swerve everyone. So you made Russo sit in his car all day. He couldn't come into the arena. He had to stay there until it was time for his run in. And he's mad that when he did get in the building, he wasn't allowed to do an interview on the program. And it's been said that nobody except Kurt Henning and Jeff Jarrett were even told that Russo was going to be at the show. Is this real? Do you remember making him wait in the car and him being upset about it? I don't remember him being upset about it, but it's like waiting in a car is not, I mean, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal, but everything was a big deal to Vince. If he thought it was something that he needed to bitch about. I, I just don't recall any of that being an issue. And if we hit him outside, it, it wasn't because we we're punishing him or you want to make the show good. That's, my that's goodness. Exactly. I, I, I just, I'm sort of scratching my head about this. And again, I like Vince Russo and I know that's going to get me some hate tweets. Spell my name, right? Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. But he's always been cool to me, so I like him. But I know I, you have history with him, and I'm just trying to understand, man, because, man, they made me wait in my car, and I didn't get to do a promo. It sounds like he thinks he's the star of the program here. Like, I don't know. Like, who gives a shit if you're doing a promo or not, right? You're supposed to be. His defense, did he even bitch about it? Did he even say that? I, I don't know. That could be the fiction. Was that fiction or nonfiction? That's fair. I, okay. I, I don't even know, but you know, I got on it I, pretty, pretty clear up top. It, it is humility. Meltzer would say this almost guarantees what the deal was the week before with Piper had to be explained because they didn't even have Russo in the building, except when he's queued to come in. Russo was never at any production meetings, nor does he interact with anyone backstage. Quote, the Jarrett's either don't care or don't think it's important that the entire attitude up and down the roster has changed, according to several within the company. It went from being a relatively happy and laid back locker room with people who had been in both companies talking about how much better it was than WCW, like night and day. Now, because management has been obsessed with following WCW's footsteps to oblivion, the locker room is a sad place to be with obvious paranoia and distrust. And the moods are far worse and people are afraid to say anything. What do you make of that report in the observer here? Maybe a slow news week. Maybe, maybe not. Let's, let's create some interesting stuff to talk about that, you know, th that could be a component of it. The other component could be this. We touched on Chris Sobel entering into the, uh, magnifying glass. That's as, again, I'm going back to culture. That's a trickle down effect. You know, uh, us being under the assumption that the budget that was put in place in these early days at closing with Panda was the one we were going to go by. And then if that was being raked over the coals, you know, less than a month in, that can create a culture change. And Again, it trickles down. It it trickles down. You know, Chris Sobel was the rep representative of Bob Carter. So when his representative creates a, a a mindset, it permeated through me and my dad, and I mean Dixie and and everybody else in the company. That's the reality of running an entertainment uh, company. It, it it the the culture created affects everything. I heard this quote this morning on a Ted talk, Conrad, me and you may use from years to come that, that I liked okay. how you do anything is how you do everything. I like that. I like that. Uh, let's talk about something else that I want to touch on sting. Meltzer would say Jeff Jarrett talked with sting when he was in Europe about coming in sting seemed receptive to at least discussing it further. Goldberg was also asked this past week about potentially coming in to do one shot and working an angle with Russo. He gave the impression he'd be interested if the price was right. Keep in mind that with Panda energy, looking at cutting back expenses and the kind of price tag, either of those guys would want. It's not as simple as it sounds to get them. I, I have no doubt that the Jeff Jarrett, I know 
even if he had just lint in his pocket, he ain't scared to just say, Hey man, you know, one day we oughta. That's the all shucks G Willikers, Jeff Jarrett that I know just plant a seed. See what happens. I don't know what could happen, but closed mouths don't get fed. And Jeff Jarrett knows that well, but did you think there was any remote possibility that you could get the money to pay for it? Or did you think I can do it? I just got to sell Bob on it. No, I we're talking two different talent. I never, ever in the history of our company thought Bill Go- Bill Goldberg was an option. I would have loved to have had that. But even in the spike days when he was doing the car show, I knew that for Bill to enter back into the industry because his baseline from the time he broke in and started on that winning streak to his WWF run, seven-figure money. Yeah. It, it, it just it, it was a complete non-starter in my brain. Why go down that route? Fun to talk about. Hey, yeah. man, maybe – Keller or Meltzer or whoever will, will perpetuate it a little bit, but it's needless chatter because it ain't happening. Sting's a different story. Always wanted him, knew that Sting would would be uh, of a mindset of, hey, maybe there's a two shot deal, maybe there's a three shot deal. Everything that kind of played out through the years, you know, uh, but it ultimately ended up on Bob Carter's desk. Well, we're going to talk about staying another day. Let's mention here that you're going to start Australian pay-per-view on December 23rd, or I'm sorry, January 23rd. It'll be Friday replays every week on the main event pay-per-view. Um, so you're trying to grow outside of just the confines of, uh, of North America and you are back on the road. You're going to be in Tokyo at sumo hall for an appearance with zero one. And you wind up teaming with Steve Carino and you're going to be standing across from couple of guys one of which is Samoa Joe I think this is the first time you and him share a ring what was your first impression of being in the ring with Samoa Joe he's super talented super athletic you know watching him over the weekend and you just think man me and him have worked together a lot yes (laughs) for 20 years now which is kind of blows me away but yeah um Steve Carino was booking zero one at the time. Uh, he had the affiliation or the history with the NWA title. Um, Hashimoto, uh, you know, came to Tennessee. Uh, there there's history there, uh, with Hashimoto, um, going way back. Uh, anyway, Hashimoto was a talent in Tennessee in his formative years. So a lot of history there. I want to touch on the Australian, uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah. We're six months into our, existence Experiment. yeah and look was it a big money deal but it was again you said earlier that's what popped in my brain about found money and the international scene and i'm here to tell you today the growth in the industry the real growth is internationally it it, it, it and i'm sitting here 20 years later saying that but that was pretty cool conrad i, I got a uh, email from a my world listener who went into great detail about he loves the hell out of our college football talk. And he gave this history that his wife um, did an internship. And anyways, they kind of picked a favorite college team and it ended up being Iowa. But anyway, um, down under, they love our college football talk, or at least some of them do. But no, uh, us getting on that pay-per-view opened up a revenue stream that was to come because a little tiny deal here gave confidence to other markets around the world that, oh, they're already doing business in India. We're already doing business in Australia. And that was, we were six months into our existence. So that was a fun deal to, to close. Let's mention and remind everybody that, uh, the last show of the year here in 2002 for you guys is December 18th. You're not going to run on Christmas day or new year's day, but on this December 18th show, we see triple X form. It's Christopher Daniels, Loki, and Elix Skipper. It's part of SEX, but this group here, Triple X, man, they're going to go on to have quite the run here. And we're going to talk about a lot of those big moments. The main event is the returning Christopher Daniels, Loki, and Skipper over the Maximos in red. It's a four and one quarter, one quarter star match. Meltzer would say the bout had amazing intensity, probably more than any match in the history of the promotion. Hmm. I'm going to recommend that everybody go out of their way to see it. We've plugged it a few times. It's worth doing it again. Uh, you need to watch this over on impact wrestling. 
impactwrestling.com forward slash packages. Be sure to use that promo code, Jeff. This December 18th, 2002 main event. My goodness. Fantastic. As a reminder, Elix Skipper, the cage walker himself, before he does that, Christopher Daniels with the best moonsault ever and low key taking on the Maximos and amazing red pretend TNA doesn't exist. This would have been the hottest quote unquote independent match anywhere in the country. And it happened on a random Wednesday, a week before Christmas, right here in Nashville, four and a quarter stars in a time where Meltzer was pretty stingy with those stars. Go out of your way to see it a phenomenal match, but they also have a surprise appearance on this program. The road warriors are here, Jeff, the road warriors. You talk about an iconic duo. The road warriors are here during a three, t- three team match with Harrison storm versus the tag champs, Lee and slash versus the Harris twins. Of course, they're not advertised. And that to me is like a real head scratcher. If you know, you've got Roddy Piper, but he says, don't advertise me. Okay. But you gotta be disappointed. Like, damn, we might could have sold some pay-per-views if we let everybody know. The same thing again here with the road warriors. Were they specific about don't advertise us? Or was this just, Hey, fans want a surprise. We'll give them one. We didn't close the deal to the night before. That's why these early days of TNA, it's just hard to put into words how I don't want to say the wild, wild west, but I mean, and look, we got those guys back, but, um, I think Joe was in town for some reason. There was a reason why the biggest reason why we didn't close the deal the the prior Wednesday. So we didn't have a week to, uh, you know, we we didn't have means to advertise. You couldn't run spots. You couldn't, you know, look, it's 2002 Twitter and Instagram, Facebook. We didn't have a way to to put it online. Maybe a website mentioned, which would have kind of killed any kind of surprise talk. So I think fundamentally we probably would have made the mindset where let's do a surprise and we'll bring them back in January. Um, that, that was just the, the nature of the beast. We've gone over the Piper deal. He didn't want it again. We didn't completely close the deal and Roddy and I believed him. And I think he thought so too. Let's see how he, again, he's selling books, but if, if the promo would have gone well and, and his book publisher would have loved it, that's something we didn't really get into. I don't think the book publisher was too happy with the comments as well. If it would have gone well, he would have been back on Wednesday, but it didn't go well. So, uh, that, that was just the nature of the beats back to that triple H comment. Look, Daniels, Chris has had a lot of success throughout his entire career. It, it goes without saying him and Kazarian, fantastic tag team, but the pairing of three, three, these three guys at this time, I thought was some magic for all three of them. I think one plus one plus one didn't equal three. I, I thought it equal to multiple. They just had a different vibe about it. And Chris ran point. He was the leader of it. The most seasoned knew how to put things together. But when you look at that six man tag, who the QB was, it goes without saying it's Daniels, but Elix, like you said, just, man, what talent in that ring? Really, really cool. It's unbelievable. And by the way, we're not done with surprises here. David flair is going to come out and, uh, put a figure four on Kurt Henning. He's a surprise. Uh, tell me about David flair. I kind of forgot he was even here. Me too. And I've racked my brain on how that came about. I have no idea. Will you call your brother-in-law and ask him, say, Hey, in December of 2002, why'd you show up on Wednesday night? How'd that happen? I'm he just, he I, just I, laughed and hang up. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Right. So, uh, this past week's show Meltzer would say it was heavy on Russo promos, but aside from his having a minor league look, meaning he's dressing like a bum on television. His delivery was strong and the promos were very good. He and Jarrett painted a good enough picture going back and forth that it wasn't the usual assuming the audience reads the internet insider interview that results in a a flat crowd reaction. Jarrett talked about wrestlers like Shawn Michaels and Goldberg who wanted to kill Russo, but he was always calming them down. Russo's guys all ended up destroying Jarrett in the first segment with the Harris twins, Daniels and Skipper all doing finishes on him. He was beat down a second time to end the show by Skipper and Daniels. With the new year wrapping up here, how are you feeling, man? I mean, we've talked so much on this 20th anniversary of you launching TNA. 
about how you put everything into this and all the ups and downs and the misrepresentation of the boss from Jay Hassman and the, the golden parachute you thought you had with Richard Scrushy and then the major federal investigation. And then all of a sudden an angel named Dixie Carter walks into your life and somehow you got to keep everybody separated with Vince Russo and your dad and some talent are playing hokey pokey and there's ups and downs and all around. But as you think back to your Christmas and new years, 20 years ago, December and January, 2022 or, or, or 2002, do you remember that time fondly, or does this feel like this was just a damn battle of attrition? Just, can we make it to next week? I think the first word as you were going in, uh, to, to kind of laying that out there, I think the first word that popped in my brain was. I survived. We survived collectively as a group. We survived. When I look back on the year and thought to myself, what? I mean, because Richard Scrushy and Hell South and the capital that he had. And when all that went down, it's hard. Conrad, we've talked about this on this podcast and we've talked about it offline. That that it's it's that was a emotional blow that I think in a lot of ways it permeated for a long long time because it there's no way certainly this young in my business career that I would have ever thought a lot of things could have gone wrong that was not even in my mindset just because of Richard's belief, his mindset, our relationship. Um, again, I'm going to go back into, you know, at the time he was 10th wealthiest CEO in the world in the top 10. I mean, you know, just a lot of, it, it wasn't like, and, and just kind of the upside and, and just all, all of it together and him gone and then spinning in this and that next thing, you know, the lady who was doing our PR her family now is the finance partners. What a year it was crazy that, and that does ha has nothing to do with the, the, the family battles with what you just said, but my father and Russo and everything that goes on with our wrestling industry. And, you know, every Wednesday night we're producing a show that's far from perfect. And there's going to be wins and losses and battles and growing a company. As I said here today, what a crash course I got in business in those six months, seven months, or 12 months. I mean, it's invaluable to me. The life lessons I learned in 2002, I carry with me today. I mean, in so many ways, it was, so it's a blessing. Uh, the obstacle is the way. There are no such thing as problems, only opportunities to grow. And boy, did I do some growing up in 2002. We're going to talk about some growing up and some growing up you did in 1997 next week. We're going to talk about your return to the WWF in 97. We're going to, uh, of course, talk about that infamous Austin 316 promo, uh, the shoot promo sitting down with JR, the Montreal screw job, his refusal to wrestle certain wrestler storyline, you know, where uh, is that my contract? This guy's beneath me. We're going to talk about all that. And we're even going to talk about being scheduled to work the undertaker in your first pay-per-view match. Uh, the DX in your house, the more risque product, the early beginnings of the new age outlaws and so much more. It's all coming your way next week here on my world. Now, if you'd like to ask a question about that or anything else, please follow us on Twitter. It's at my world pod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's at my world pod. Uh, also be sure to check out Jeff on uh, Facebook. He's at real Jeff Jarrett. You'll also find him on Twitter and Instagram at real Jeff Jarrett. Speaking of uh, the holiday season, I want to remind everybody we got some big stuff planned at the end of the month. I can't believe this is real, but on Wednesday, December 28th, on the exact 25th anniversary of Starcade 1997, the biggest WCW pay per view in history, we've got Eric Bischoff sitting in the hot seat again to moderate, and I'm going to moderate a discussion between him and Nick Patrick. We're calling it the fast count. We all know what was supposed to happen. And we all know it didn't happen. We're going to talk about why, and you get to watch live and ask questions over on adfreeshows.com. Just last week, we had Kevin Nash and Sean Oliver take a look at Starcade 98 
Nash did a live watch along and answered your questions from when he became the guy to beat the streak and become the world champion while he was Booker. That's available now at adfreeshows.com. And, uh, of course, when you join adfreeshows.com, you also get an opportunity to sit in and ask live questions. You get to see our live tapings. We're doing that right now. Mitchell Barnett over in the chat says, Hey, double J got any hilarious bullet Bob stories you can share. Oh, I got some that I can't share. No. <laughs> um, I mean, hilarious stories. Look, I, I always, Bob was, I always kind of wanted to sit under his learning tree and I'd pick his brain. Uh, he'd tell me some funny stories about my dad or my grandfather, him and Eddie Marley, my grandfather traveled together and, uh, they used to both like their gin. So, uh, just, just he, God rest his soul. I love the bullet. Hilarious stories. Nothing that comes to my mind. Sorry about that, Mitchell. No, all good. Uh, Lee camp wants to know question. Do you think Ron killings has reached his potential or is he a missed opportunity? I'm a huge fan of him myself in the ring and his ability as an entertainer. So I often thought this, and I'm not just saying about the last couple of years when he was 20, I, I, yeah, like all the way. I mean, had, uh, last couple of years, you look back and he's had, he's been a comedy performer for years and years, but I thought this for a long time, had the chairman, had Vince McMahon viewed Ron just a little bit differently as, as someone that we're going to, we're going to back off comedy not for the week or the month, but for this run. And we're, we're going to completely get off the comedy and we're going to be serious. And you can throw in a tinge of, you know, one liners here and there, but really focus on going down, um, a different Avenue for Ron. I, I believe it would have worked. I believe it would have gone to another level. Uh, but that, that never happened. So when he says, did it reach its potential? Ron always took something good and made it great. So for that answer, yes. Could it have been even bigger? I do think so. Yes. Maddie Goshen says, do you think social media would have been a blessing or a burden with all the moving parts and cooks in the kitchen? So think back to 2002. Do you think oh. that social media would have added to or taken away from the chaos? I think it would have been a huge bonus. I'm a huge fan of social media because it's an instantaneous voice. You know, the age of instant information uh, that we all can, Conrad, you flip over on your Google machine. You know, I mean, in boom, you can get facts and figures right away. Uh, but in our business, the entertainment avenue is you can – you can promote, you can narrate, you can tell stories. Uh, I think it'd been a huge positive for early TNA. Matter of fact, in a lot of ways, a game changer. Well, I, I for one am, uh, am grateful that we got the opportunity to revisit your first year in business here for TNA. Oh, speaking of grateful How about that Bischoff's brand new book. It's uh, up on Amazon right now. You can also pick up a copy at bischoffbook.com, but Amazon can hook you up. You can get it on Kindle. You can get a paperback. You can get a hardback. And it is the perfect Christmas present for the wrestling fan in your life. We can't recommend it enough here. We think a lot of Eric and uh, all of his accomplishments in the business. And uh, I don't think maybe Ric Flair does, but everybody else does. Go check it out. Grateful. If you're looking on Amazon, just type in Grateful and Eric Bischoff. There it will be. It's, uh, it's making a lot of news, man. He, he innovated once again. I don't know that you've seen this, but he's got QR codes at the end of each chapter. You scan it and you go to, it goes to a private interview that, uh, you get to hear. So it's more than just a book. It's a series of interviews with the subjects that he's discussing. So pretty cool stuff. It's grateful available now by Eric Bischoff on Amazon. Jeff, I had a, a lot of fun today. Anything else we want to touch on before we get ready for a big week next week? Talking about you in 1997. Always a blast, Pally. Pally. That's what Jackie Fargo used to call folks. Hey, Pally. No, all good, man. I'm excited. Life is good. Santa Claus is on the way. Connie, we got a big meeting today. You better we do. Ready. I got my bag packed. It's ready to roll. And uh, as soon as I hang up with you, I'm putting it in the wind, Daddy. And we can't talk about what it is, but 
Stay tuned. You'll find out soon enough right here on my world. Jeff Jarrett. Peace.